those that's taken it online. Again, you have to uh, fill out the information on the Qualtrics um, all the way through, make sure it gets submitted to make sure that you get credit for this class. Um, otherwise, we will not technically know you did complete it. Other than that, uh, folks that's in person anywhere, make sure you complete your quiz here. Um, also, there should be a sign-in sheet for folks that are in person at, that has your farm name and all that kind of stuff on it. All that information is for KDA to be able to send you your, your sampling, or not your sampling, I lied. Um, to send you your produce best practice training certificate. So then the certificate uh, for sampling is a separate application and you'll have to do that on your own. But we will get this submitted to KDA next week. All right, any also, further oh, go ahead. Also, this will be recorded and the link will be emailed out as soon as we get it posted. So if you wanna rewatch it, if you have questions again, uh, we'll have that too. Sorry, April. That's good. Anybody else have anything? Any questions before we get started? All right, I'm gonna get started. Uh, Philip, text me if you can't hear anything, okay? Um, maybe, maybe I'll get it started here. Sorry, it takes a little bit. Close my wrong folder. I have plenty of things open on my side, so sorry. Welcome to Produce Best Practices Training. Food safety has received increasingly more attention in the last decade. This training will help you understand best practices to help reduce food safety risks on your produce operation. Everything in this training is completely voluntary, but as legislation evolves, new regulations may apply to your farm. There are three main food safety programs produce growers should be aware of. The first program is the produce best practices training presented in this video. The training is intended to provide introductory knowledge of produce food safety. Completion of this PBPT training program by at least one individual associated with a farm operation is a requirement in order to receive an all sample certificate, which allows the sampling of raw fruits and vegetables at the Kentucky Department of Agriculture registered farmers markets and Farm Bureau certified roadside markets. Participants will be issued a Produce Best Practices Training Diploma. Third Party GAP is an audit based certification program that is based on buyer requirements. What this means is that you only need to worry about this if your buyer is requiring it. Generally, farmers market vendors will not need this kind of certification. If you think you may need a third party gap audit, your county agent can help you get started. The Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA is a federal regulation, different from third party gap audit. The produce safety rule is the portion of FISMA that specifically applies to produce growers. If your farm has had an average of more than $25,000 total sales per year over the last three years. FISMA may apply to you. Your agent can help you check whether FISMA applies to you. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that each year, nearly one in six Americans 
get sick. 128,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 die of foodborne diseases. Why would fresh produce contribute to that number? Many fresh fruits and vegetables are eaten uncooked. There is no kill step. Microbial contamination is difficult to remove once present on the surface of fruits and vegetables. Microbes can easily become internalized through natural features such as stem scars or wounds or injury. It's not simply a case of visibly dirty produce. This graph highlights the diversity of produce items that have been implicated in foodborne illness outbreaks where the source of the outbreak likely occurred prior to retail or consumer preparation. Contamination can come from a variety of sources including humans, soil, animals, water, buildings, equipment, or other sources. Animal and human feces is the single greatest threat to on-farm food safety. Water poses the other major risk. Bacteria, viruses, and parasites are the key causes of foodborne illnesses in produce. Common symptoms of foodborne illness are fever, nausea, diarrhea, headaches, and cramps. The most susceptible populations are infants and children under five, elderly populations, pregnant women, and immunocompromised or otherwise ill people. Not all problems start on the farm. Some of the most common food mistakes are not maintaining holding temperature, using poor hygiene practices, improper cooking, contaminated equipment, or getting products from unsafe sources. For food safety issues originating on the farm, developing a prevention plan is the best defense against foodborne illness. If you have the ability to exert control over any portion of the supply chain, do so in a way that improves the food safety of the product. This includes pre-season decisions while planting, irrigating, fertilizing and spraying, during and after harvest, during transport and storage, and at the market. Next, we will walk through a few different specific things you will want to consider to prevent food safety risks on your farm. When you're planning your production, mapping your farm can be effective in looking at possible negative associations. Are livestock directly adjacent to vegetables with no buffer? Is a cull pile or manure pile draining into the field when it rains? Do you know how the neighbor manages the field that drains onto yours or that sends dust your way? Is the area subject to flooding or potential chemical contamination? If you think there may be issues with one or more of these problems, having your soil tested is a great next step. Avoid planting in or around septic drain fields, lagoons, or lateral lines. Fecal matter poses the greatest risk to on-farm food safety. You can still apply raw manure to your fields, but the best practice is called the 90 or 120 day rule. If you are growing crops where the harvestable portion of the crop will not come in contact with the soil and manure, then you should apply the manure at least 90 days before harvest. Examples of 90-day crops would be tomatoes, peppers, corn, okra, etc. If the harvestable portion of the crop comes in contact with the soil, then you should apply the manure at least 120 days prior to harvest. Examples of 120-day crops are melons, squash, beets, carrots, potatoes, radishes, lettuces, etc. If in doubt, always use the 120-day rule. Proper composting with documented correct temperatures can reduce the risks posed by manure. Generally, home compost piles do not get hot enough to reduce pathogens. Reputable compost dealers will provide temperature records on request. 
as a best practice, keep the compost covered to prevent contamination. Water is a key part of agricultural production. And the risks and preventive measures depend on how the water is being used. Indirect contamination from runoff and flooding can also be a problem. You can reduce risk by paying attention to where animals, manure, and coal piles are located relative to growing and packing areas. Flooding is a major challenge in certain parts of the state. According to the Food and Drug Administration, ready-to-eat crops like melons and leafy greens should be excluded from the food supply when they come into contact with flood waters. With irrigation and other water applications, water sources pose different levels of risk. The following water sources are listed in order from greatest risk to least risk. Surface water, cisterns, wells, and municipal source. With all non-municipal water sources, the best practice is to have the water tested to verify that it is safe. Risk also varies by irrigation method. Irrigation methods listed from greatest risk to least are overhead irrigation, furrow irrigation, triple or drip bare ground, and trickle or drip under plastic. Since spray water and post harvest water are coming directly into contact with the product, the best practice is to use portable or drinking water. You may wish to use food grade sanitizers in your wash water to help further reduce risks. Always follow the instructions from the manufacturer to ensure that the sanitizer is working effectively. Many producers have the knee-jerk reaction to simply wash produce to make it clean. If your customer or buyer does not require you to wash your product, there are several good reasons not to wash it. Washing is not effective at eliminating microbial contamination due to many factors, such as the texture of produce surface. For example, the rinds on the surface of a cantaloupe. Some pathogens may be internalized into the fruit or vegetable. Washing can negatively affect shelf life. Washing can become a source of an outbreak. Humans are the animals that pose the greatest risk to food safety on the farm. But non-human animals can cause problems too. Wildlife or domestic animals can chew, trample, or defecate on and around crops. This may make food unsafe, but there are a few steps you can take to reduce risk. Before harvesting, you or an employee should walk the field looking for potential sources of contamination. These might include feces, animal tracks, or even feeding damage. Using flags or some other visible marker, identify any places you see signs of animal damage or waste. You'll need to decide how large of a radius you want to exclude from harvest, but somewhere in the two to five foot range is typical. The most important thing is that this protocol is specified in your food safety manual and that all employees are trained not to harvest from this area. These simple steps reduce the risk and help keep your food safe. Farming isn't like some professions with pristine clothing and all day air conditioning. Nevertheless, there are a few common sense hygiene practices you can do to make sure that you and your workers don't make your consumers sick. No one is expecting you to wear a crisp white linen suit. Farming gets dirty, but when it's time to harvest, you and your employees should be wearing clean clothes free of loose soil and other contaminants. Having a change of clothes or a clean pair of harvest overalls will probably come in handy. Don't forget to think about footwear cleanliness. If you're coming from an area of potential contamination, such as the livestock paddock, you will want to clean and sanitize your boots as well. If you or one of your workers feels ill, send them home. We understand this is a hard thing to do, but communicable diseases can be spread to the food during harvest. Every cough, sniffly nose, or fever is a red flag for liability. Removing jewelry like rings, necklaces, or earrings may seem like overkill, 
but a customer breaking a tooth on a pendant earring, or worse, swallowing it, is too big of a risk to take. Public health officials have been preaching this one for decades because it works. Wash your hands. Count to 20 or say your ABCs. Use soap and dry thoroughly. Clean your tools. This might be the easiest one to forget, but it's really important. That knife is cutting into every piece of produce you harvest. Your tools might even touch the food you harvest more than your hands do. Take care of yourself and your workers by providing water and a space for breaks. Healthy and happy workers are better able to do their jobs. If there are incidents or actions you have to take, including sending someone home, be sure to record it in the logs associated with your food safety plan. Worker health and hygiene aren't complex, but they are central to keeping food safe. You've done all your pre-harvest sanitation, you washed your hands, your knives, and you may have even put on gloves. Your harvest is well underway, and then something unexpected happens. You or your worker might be tempted to ignore an injury, rub a little dirt on it, and tough it out. But bodily fluids can be a source of contamination. It's important to mark and quarantine any areas potentially contaminated by bodily fluids. This can be as simple as a pin flag or other marker. No one will harvest within an established radius around that flag. If you aren't working alone, let your coworkers or supervisor know about an incident. Treat the wound according to first aid protocols. Take care of your workers or yourself. Small cuts can be covered by just a bandage. In the case of severe cuts, bandage the area and then place a latex or nitrile glove over the injury. Simply make a note that the incident happened in whatever log you have available and that's it, you're back to work. Whether it's a cut, an equipment leak, or some other inevitable variable of farm work, the most important thing is to have realistic policies in place and written down. When you collect your policies in one place, you have a food safety plan. This central document makes training employees and preparing for any potential audits or recalls simple and straightforward. So remember, if you have an injury in the field, for the sake of keeping our food safe and your customers healthy, report it, mark it, treat it, cover it, and recorded. Hand washing stations don't have to be complex or expensive. There are a few simple requirements. Must have a container of portable water with a free flowing valve. Must have a catch basin for water. Must have liquid soap. Disposable towels or paper towels. Waste container for towels. Cross contamination is a serious risk especially on farms that grow livestock and produce. Clothing, shoes, and hands can all spread disease, especially if workers are moving from livestock areas to produce areas. Be mindful of visitors as potential sources of contamination. Equipment can be another vector for cross-contamination. Exercise caution with equipment used in livestock and produce and be sure that you can clean and sanitize any shared use or used equipment you decide to use on your farm. Be sure that all chemicals, including cleaning products, are clearly labeled with the correct name. Post-harvest equipment has been implicated in several prominent foodborne illness outbreaks. Post-harvest equipment must be configured in a manner that allows complete, thorough cleaning and sanitizing. This can be accomplished with access panels or disassembly options. A clothes washing machine used to wash leafy greens does not meet this requirement. Remember, if you can avoid washing your product, you should do so. Not washing can save a lot of complexity and reduce risks. Cleaning generally refers to removing dirt, debris, etc. from the surfaces. Sanitizing after cleaning involves applying a food grade sanitizer such as food grade bleach or a peroxide based sanitizer according to the manufacturer's directions. Harvest containers should be protected from contact with the soil and be cleaned 
and sanitize before each use. Don't forget to clean and sanitize tools as well. If you are using reusable plastic crates, be sure that they are cleaned and sanitized before each use. Avoid the temptation to reuse cardboard wax and other kind of one-use boxes. While there is cost associated with using old boxes, the risks are simply too high not to. Temperature management through the packing and storing process can help reduce risks further and extend shelf life of your products. Low temperatures supplement good sanitation practices. Avoid delays that postpone cooling. Consider time from harvest to packing house, time from arrival to cooling of the produce, and speed of cooling and final temperature. With all of the practices above, keep records of the preventive steps you take. This keeps you from relying on your memory. There are many other benefits of proper record keeping, such as you may have to show records to a buyer. Records provide proof of your good intent. Records provide your best defense in a lawsuit. Records provide a clear review of your own farm operation. You should consider keeping records related to water, manure, product storage and transportation, cleaning and worker training. A strong farm food safety plan begins with approaching all aspects of your farm with the mindset of how does this improve or impair the food safety of the operation. In the process of making a food safety plan, accept that limitations do exist and be realistic about what you can accomplish. Start with identifying risks that are most likely to occur, making a special note if they could happen often and more importantly, rank your risks. Next, define practices that will reduce the identified risks. And finally, always document and revise. As food safety requirements and regulation continue, it is a good idea to become familiar with the concept of traceability. This simply means documenting where a product came from and where it goes. Specifically, we are concerned with knowing one step back, such as the field or the person you bought the product from, and one step forward, the person or entity who bought the product from you. There are many different ways to accomplish this traceability, but even a simple system is better than none at all. If you are interested in developing a traceability system, your local county agent can connect you with a specialist. On farm produce safety, including good agriculture practices or GAP, produce best practices training, or FISMA, all are a continuum. You will never reach a point where you don't think about what you're doing and how you could enhance the safety of your farm. All right, so now I'll share um, the QR code for those on Zoom. You're welcome to scan this code and with your phone, all you have to do is open up your picture camera and it will, it should take you right to it. You should be able just to click on it. Uh, April, what if, what if we are on our phone actually? <laughs> what is it? Well, what if we're on our phone? It, and we can't take a uh, picture of it right okay. now. That's um, okay. Um, hold on just a I can, second. I'll I can screenshot it. it. Okay. Yeah, I can send get a link. So hold on just a minute. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then those in person, I've already handed out the quiz to all the folks here in person. So if you're in person, you can take the other quiz and you should be good to go. So.
Okay, I put the link in the chat as well. So you should be able to click on that. So make sure everyone um, does complete that, even if you've got multiple people watching with you. So um, make sure everyone does that, completes it, make sure it says confirmed at the end that you did submit it and you should be good. Um, also, anyone that is still on Zoom that did not have a name, will you put your name in the chat box? Your name can be seen. I'm good, but I've seen several with iPhone and I think there's a Galaxy one. Um, so that'll help us make sure that we get. Covered. April, where did you send the link to? It's on in the chat. Phone. It's in the chat? Yes, yeah, okay. just open up the chat box. And I'll keep this going for about eight more minutes and um, give everyone time to either do the uh, QR code or to click on the link. If something happens and I stop the, the Zoom tonight um, and you need the link, just let me know, just shoot me an email. Otherwise, I'm gonna put it on mute right now. So let me know if you need me. <coughs> Oops. 